In this day, corporate ownership is the rule. Profit margins have become too small for entrepreneurs. It costs six million dollars to cross the Atlantic. Just to break even, the ship must carry 1,200 passengers, a 60% occupancy rate. In 1900, the liners operated in a far different economy, and they were worth their weight in gold. At the turn of the century, it was a different world. Ship owners and ships were different, too. Fortunes were made by men who were said to have the morals of riverboat gamblers. And a shipping monopoly had the same luster as railroads or steel, oil or coal. In 1899, one tycoon set out to control every shipping line he could buy with cash or steal with a promise. He was John Pierpont Morgan. Morgan was born in 1837. It must have been the year of the steamship. Isambard Brunel was planning the Great Western. Samuel Cunard, the Britannia. Both had begun their conquest of the Atlantic. When Morgan was old enough, he would try to own it. Critics called him a beefy, thick-necked financial bully, drunk with wealth and power, yelling orders to stock markets, courts, foreign governments, and the nation. Morgan wanted the monopoly on transportation. He had the trains, now he wanted the ships. To get them, he started a ruthless price war. First, he bought two shipping lines, then offered customers a land and sea deal to carry their freight. He drove prices so low that ships without trains were forced to sign on, then sell out. By 1901, Morgan controlled all of the world's major shipping lines except the French and Cunard. His most famous ship would be the Titanic. Morgan set out to create a daily passenger service. His ships, like his trains, would leave on time, around the clock. Albert Ballin called him a genius. Teddy Roosevelt said he was the last pirate. When Morgan bought a controlling interest in Ballin's German ships and paid him a million dollars to run the company, Cunard was in grave danger. It looked like the end. Morgan's money and Ballin's ships had begun to attract the lion's share of Atlantic passengers. Cunard's vessels seemed feeble and dull more like ferries than floating palaces. The British uh, were just being beaten right and left. Their ships were not the best. I think the turning point uh, probably was the German four stackers. They were two and two stacks on German ships. And they also went farther, much farther, than any other companies have ever gone as far as luxury, really outstanding luxury. As Morgan Ballen and the Kaiser were meeting to discuss the future of the Atlantic, Cunard suffered a major embarrassment. The 20-year-old Etruria fractured her single propeller at sea and had to be towed. The Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross, the Crown Prince Wilhelm, the Crown Princess in Sicily, the Kaiser Wilhelm II, these were the great German greyhounds. And those were the kind of ships that Cunard was going to build. To build ships of this quality, of this speed, of this expense, they needed help. They went to the Admiralty and they got it. The condition was that they would be capable of being converted as armed merchant cruisers. And so, with the backing of a 20-year government loan, Cunard began two new ships. In the end, they built three, the Mauritania and Lusitania of 1907, and the Aquitania of 1913. The company's grand trio would set a new standard. Mauritania and Lusitania were nearly identical. 88 feet wide and almost 800 feet long, 
They were five decks high and carried four smokestacks that vented the fumes of a thousand tons of coal a day. Their four propellers were driven by the largest turbine engines ever built for an ocean liner. The Aquitania was mechanically equal in every way. Inside, she was even more beautiful. Two of the new ships would survive three decades. One would be sunk in her prime. Mauritania was built in Newcastle, England, on the banks of the River Tyne. Lusitania and Aquitania in Glasgow, Scotland, on the Clyde at the John Brown shipyard. Here, in the heartland of James Watt's Industrial Revolution and the University of Glasgow, some of the world's best engineering minds and skillful hands created the newest Cunard superliners. My father was out of a dirt. He was what you call a hydraulic riveter. The big machines with clump jaws, big heavy rivets. Whole families worked on the ship. An apprenticeship was a father's legacy to his 14-year-old son. The work had a rhythm, a smell, and a sound to it. The dabbing and hammering, the white-hot steel, the riveting. Fathers and sons, uncles and cousins, a natural order, a natural beat. If a stranger had to fill in, one man said, It'd break your heart. How would they know who had the first hit and who the last without stopping the pace to tell them? It was a dirty job. No one wore overalls, moleskin trousers instead. They'd be soaked with sweat enough to stand by themselves outside many a Glasgow door. It was a six day, 57 hour work week. When the ship was completed, you were out of a job until the next ship came along. When the final work was done, four million molten rivets had been driven into plates of Sheffield steel nearly two inches thick. Some sections weighed five tons. Giant floating palaces built by hand with the tools of a blacksmith. Shipwright makes ships. A shipwright's on a ship from the blocks that holds it up until it's finished. The skeleton of the ship is done by another trade called a loftsman. And they draw all the frames, everything on the loft floor, screeve them in with their knife. And then the planters and the iron workers come up and take template molds. And they would go back and fashion up the steel. The riveters were in the double bottoms of the ship when it was starting to be built. It was all underneath the double bottoms. And the catch boy would get the rivet from the rivet eater. And he would throw it and he would catch it in this wee cup. And then he would put it down beside the riveter. He would take the tongs and put it in the hole. Canard's grand trio would be the fastest ships on the Atlantic. They would signal the return of British supremacy of the sea. They were really very, very serious and honest in their effort to make these ships, the Mauritania, Lusitania, the finest par excellence. Nothing was spared. Gorgeous, uh, small promenade decks, and the luxury suites. Nothing was anything like that in other vessels before. They wanted them to be the finest every detail. Canard's new liners were extraordinary in other ways. The Mauritania, said one historian, was the most costly decorated vessel afloat. British in style, treatment and workmanship, 
solid and durable. It fulfills our national traditions. 300 Palestinian craftsmen were brought to England to hand carve the woodwork for the Mauritania. Ernest Kennard, the late founder's nephew, tried to lure prized architect Arthur Davis from rival Albert Ballon, but he failed, at least for now. Instead, James Miller designed the Lusitania and Harold Pateau the Mauritania. In the process, Pateau nearly quit. When Cunard was negotiating with Harold Pito to decorate the Mauritania, they had the most frightful row with him, really, over how much was going to be paid. Harold Pito wanted £7,000 for the job of decorating first-class rooms in the Mauritania. Cunard threw up their hands in horror that they'd never heard of anything like this before. They were offering him three to 4000 and Harold Pito was not amused. He was used to bigger figures. He was used to doing things in style. He liked to use the best materials like lavish marbles. In the end, uh, old Ernest Cunard said, look, this is basically how it's got to be. This man's special, I think we should go for it. So in the end, they offered him more, about 5,000 pounds. Harold Pito accepted it, created a masterpiece, and then never decorated another ship again. Magnificent as the Lusitania and Mauritania were, the last of Cunard's new trio, the Aquitania would be the best. The QE2 arrives south of Newfoundland's Grand Banks at noon. This part of the ocean was once one of the most heavily trafficked of sea lanes. That was just a generation ago. Today, the QE2 is the last of her kind. No other ship competes for passengers on the Atlantic. Some weather information for you. The outside air temperature is 11 degrees Celsius, that's 52 Fahrenheit. And the sea temperature is 5 degrees Celsius, 41 Fahrenheit. There's a lot of high level cloud, but it's otherwise fine and clear. It was a different world in 1890. The Germans dominated the ocean. The Norddeutscher Lloyd Company won the Blue Ribbant with the Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse and the Kaiser Wilhelm II, the fastest and largest ships of the era. In 1897, the North German Lloyd built the ship Kaiser Wilhelm der Große, who was built in a German yard and who was the biggest ship in the world and who was the fastest ship in the world. And that's here quite important because from that time on, 1897, the competition on the North Atlantic became an international one in the real sense of the world. For the first time, a German ship won the Blue Ribbon and was the biggest ship in the world. Only the advent of Cunard's Grand Trio broke the German grip on the Atlantic. Of those three ships, the Lusitania, Mauritania and Aquitania, the Aquitania was considered the most beautiful in the world. The Aquitania was really another one that has tremendous throng of admirers. Many people would say she was their favorite. She had four stacks to start with. She had a uh, bridge which had two pilot houses. Originally, the bridge was one deck lower than it eventually became because they couldn't see over the bow. It was so far forward. They had to have a second pilot house put on top of the first pilot house. Her stacks were absolutely magnificent, uh, a very slight slant to them. Her interiors were stunning, every design and detail, both mechanical and aesthetic, were superbly engineered. This time, Canard succeeded in luring architect Arthur Davis away from Albert Ballon. Under an agreement worked out between the rivals, Canard and the Hamburg American Line, Davis designed Aquitania in England, while his partner, Charles Mevis, continued on German ships in Germany. 
Aquitania was an amalgam of every style and period of European culture. Its swimming pool was the first on a canard ship. And she carried the first electric elevator. Aquitania's public rooms had a distinct English flavor. And the ship had something else that was new. Instead of steerage, Canard had installed third-class tourist cabins. Davis always said he designed his ships for seasick American ladies who wanted to feel as though they were in a luxury hotel, not on the storm-tossed Atlantic. Most passengers agreed. They felt as if they were still on shore. Her lounge was one of the finest of all ships. Her promenade decks were just wonderful. You could go up and down there, and half of the promenade deck was glass enclosed. That was a big step forward. While Davis was making the Aquitania a model of elegance, his partner Charles Mevis was doing the same for his German clients. Under the direction of Albert Ballon, the ships of 1912, the Vaterland and the Imperator, were launched. Ballon was determined that these ships would be even better than Canard's Grand Trio. The Germans were producing a ship called the Imperata, the first ship to exceed 50,000 tons, over 900 feet, carried 4,600 passengers, extraordinary figures. She was a true maritime behemoth. And this ship was designed for the North Atlantic run. She had an interior pool that was straight out of Byzantium, Rome. She had every possible amenity on board, you know, the German predilection with health salons and saunas and so forth, magnificent lounges. She was the lead to a series of three successively bigger ships, Imperata, Vaterland, and if the war hadn't started, the Bismarck. And boy, what a run Britain would have had to deal with those three ships. At her launch, the Kaiser, dressed as an admiral, was positively jubilant. So was Albert Ballon as the largest ship in the world slid into the water. Mevis put his heart into the Imperator. His theme was 18th century France. For the first time ever, a ship was built to accommodate its inner architecture. Form did not follow function. Mevis had the ship's funnels moved from the center to the side, opening more space than ever for huge public rooms with soaring ceilings. The design was palatial. True to his client's preferences, Mevis made the social rooms much more informal than those on British ships. He added more chairs and put them closer together to invoke larger gatherings a distinctly Bauhaus attitude. The design was also intended to encourage husbands and wives to be together. There was no segregation of the sexes in the social rooms. Other areas like the men's smoking room or the women's writing salon could accommodate that. For his German client, Mevis added skylights in place of the British taste for domes. There were ornamental staircases made from African hardwoods. A bath and fitness suite to please the German taste for athletics. And then extras, like the world's first floating barbershop. But the marble Mevis had built into the Imperator became a serious problem. The Imperator always had a small list to pour. She had a, a tremendous amount of marble, and it was all over the ship, as even on top. They never gave any thought to the metacentric height principle. She really was top-heavy. They cut off 15 feet from her smokestacks. They removed the heavy marble from her upper uh, luxurious rooms, and it never worked. She had a superb figurehead which was really a kind of a laugh today. It was a great monster 
sticking out over the bow, and it had a very real purpose. It made her longer than the Aquitania. That huge eagle with a world in its claws was knocked off on the third voyage by a terrible wave. But did they change the length? Never. They always kept that extended length, nine feet more, because of the eagle, so that they could say they were longer than the Aquitania. German and British, these were the floating palaces, a mirror of their times. The new competition was a boon to the ocean-going traveler. The ships provided a stage for an experience like no other. First class was always as elegant as as wonderful as you can imagine. Beautifully dressed, jewels, uh, great arrivals into the dining room, you know, clothes being laid out for dinner, that kind of thing. Your own butler, your own maid on board. There's no doubt that uh, living on a great liner was the most wonderful experience any wealthy person could possibly have. The cabins were outstanding. The big public rooms, the swimming pool, the uh, dining room, the main lounge were all two or three decks high. It was top deck, elegant first class, marble clad, potted palms, silver plated toilet seats, maids for the maids, great trunks. You never had to pass the salt, there was always someone waiting. Novelist Somerset Maugham was a frequent passenger on transatlantic crossings. Many of his characters were based on real people he met on board in both first and second class. Second class was a little less luxurious, a little less spacious, but fine, sort of the club class of its time as we have on planes today. Kennard said second was always the better way to go. It had lacked the strict formality of first class and the true informality of third class. It was always the happy medium. Take the finest hotel in the world, the Waldorf Astoria. It's absolutely nothing compared to a ship. There was so much more glamour to a ship than a hotel. Shake the wall of the story a little bit, that she'd fall apart. The ship is an entity, and she's fighting the greatest foe any human would fight, the Atlantic Ocean, and she wins. It seemed an Atlantic crossing would be forever elegant, opulent, and genteel. But for Germany, that happy day of the Imperator's launch was also the beginning of its darkness. No one knew, not the Kaiser, not Balin, not even her envious rivals across the Channel, that the world's largest and most magnificent ships would soon be making their last crossings under the German flag. It is her fourth and final day at sea. Tomorrow, the QE2 will arrive in New York. Then, after six hours, she will head back to Southampton. The urgent mission today is to enjoy the ship for just one more day. It is a final chance to relax. It may be the last chance for some time. Given the mood of the day, it is hard to imagine that a liner like the QE-2 was once a target. It is August 1914. Germany is at war with Britain and France. The North Atlantic is in chaos. 30 German ships are trapped in American ports while British cruisers lie in wait to sink them. Among them is the Vaterland, a newborn to the Atlantic. While the Vaterland is held hostage in New York, other ocean liners are readied for war.
Germany arms the Kaiser Wilhelm II. The British do the same with Mauritania, Olympic, and Carmania. The Aquitania is refitted as a hospital ship. Germany's strategy is to cut the British lifeline. Every merchant ship is a target. One confrontation occurred at Trinidad, off the coast of Venezuela. Carmania was the Cunard Line, beautiful vessel, 20,000 tons, at that time one of the largest in the world. The Cap Trafalgar was even more glamorous, South American luxury, German ownership, three smokestacks. The two ships were both very fine vessels, and to have them shooting at each other, firing guns at each other, was the most sacrilegious, horrible thing I've ever heard of in my whole life. And it ended up with the Carmania sinking the Cap Trafalgar. But the Carmania herself was so terribly damaged, she just barely was able to limp into Gibraltar and had to spend over a year to be rebuilt again. It was an example of World War I at its worst. May 1st, 1915. The war is nine months old. The Cunard liner Lusitania is scheduled to leave New York at 2 p.m. with 1,965 passengers and crew. They are unaware of the danger beyond the horizon. Among the noteworthy to go aboard are Alfred Vanderbilt, en route to London to talk with some business associates about a horse show. And theatrical impresario Charles Froman, the Colossus of Broadway. Among his productions, Peter Pan. He's hoping to find a new play for American audiences. Among the rest are 440 women, 90 children, and 39 infants. This morning, a notice appears in the newspaper. It warns that vessels flying the British flag enter war zones at their own risk. Most have booked their passage months in advance. This last-minute threat seems like German bravado. Besides, there is a law among nations in war. No unarmed merchant ship can be sunk without warning or before its passengers have been removed. A few transfer to ships flying neutral flags. No one knows that German spies have been all about the Canard dock. They have reported a cargo of munitions aboard Lusitania. 5,400 cases of unloaded cartridges and shrapnel shells. An uneasiness accompanies the sailing. The captain tries to calm the passengers. Lusitania can certainly outrun any U-boat. They travel only 15 knots on the surface and only nine underwater. The Lusitania will cruise at 25 knots. Some passengers suggest that the lifeboats be lowered and carried closer to the water. The captain declines. By the time the great liner reaches the Irish Sea, 12 Allied ships have been torpedoed. One submarine, U-20, has sent three of them to the bottom. Eight miles off the coast of Ireland, U-20 waits for more targets. The captain has only two torpedoes remaining. To the U-boat captain, the Lusitania is so large, it looks like one ship towing another. A cable from the Admiralty instructs the Lusitania's captain to take Liverpool pilot at the bar, avoid headlands, pass harbors at full speed, steer a zigzag mid-channel course. The cable also warns submarines off fastnet. In the morning, the captain reduces Lusitania's speed to make the tide at Liverpool and ignores the rest of the cable.
Suddenly, the great liner changes direction, reduces speed, and steers a course directly in front of the U-boat, only 200 meters away. Alice Drury, then 19 years old, remembers the moment of crisis. We were on the deck, and we just come down to lunch. We were just inside the dining room, just inside the door, so we could get out quick because we'd had rumors something that might happen. The U-boat aims one of its two torpedoes at Lusitania's starboard, just behind the bridge. At just after two o'clock, Leslie Morton, an 18-year-old seaman, finishes stowing luggage and goes to the deck. The captain has doubled the lookouts. Two o'clock, fortunately for me, uh, I was to go on the extra lookout in the eyes of the ship, and at ten past two, practically exactly, I was looking out on the starboard bow, and I saw disturbance in the water, and then I saw the run of the two torpedoes, one slightly behind the other, and reported to the bridge through the megaphone, torpedoes coming on the starboard side. That was the most real when people panicked. He was crying, well, I don't want to be drowned. I don't want to be drowned. The lifeboat landed in the water almost as I did. But the horror to me is to see that beautiful boat disappear under my very eyes. And all I could see was, was bodies. In just 18 minutes, the Lusitania, one of the premier floating palaces of the Atlantic, is gone. Screams from hundreds thrown into the water gradually fade away as one life after another slips beneath the waves. 30 minutes later, there is only silence. Only seven lifeboats reach Queenstown. She listed too sharply to launch the other 15. Eighty years later, the people of Queenstown, now Cove, still live with the memory of that day. Michael Callopy works near the docks where the first boatloads of the living and the dead came ashore. Right here in this spot is where you would have seen the bodies laid out, right on the quays along here, the lifeboats right here underneath us, and the people doing everything in their power to try and bring some sort of comfort and reasoning to what had just happened to them. The dead number 1198. Among them, 286 women, 59 children, 39 infants. In the urgency to save the youngest passengers, they were the first placed into lifeboats. But it was a fatal mistake. In the panic, the first boats overturned and spilled the youngest victims to their deaths. The survivors are fed and sheltered by the families of Queenstown. For weeks, thick clumps of wreckage are strewn along the shore. Days later, within sight of the disaster, an ecumenical service is held at St. Coleman's Cathedral. Some of the bodies are returned to their homes beyond Ireland.
The rest are buried here in Queenstown. Two hundred are never identified. Seven hundred are never found. In Germany, the Kaiser declares a national holiday. A commemorative medallion is minted. In still neutral America, a propaganda war begins. April 1917, America enters the war. Every German ship in an American port is seized. In New York, the Vaterland, the former pride of Germany, is renamed Leviathan and becomes the world's largest troop ship. She will carry 10,000 American troops to Europe. The war escalates. At sea, the Germans have sunk nearly 11 million tons of Allied shipping. Something must be done. In October 1917, the British Admiralty begins a bold experiment. The merchant fleet is camouflaged with what are called dazzle paint schemes. The idea is based on principles of animal camouflage and with the help of a noted marine artist. The point about dazzle painting was not to make a ship invisible. Uh, because obviously you couldn't make a ship invisible, particularly if the light was behind it. The point of the dazzle painting was to break up the outline of the ship and to confuse the U-boat commander as to which direction the ship was travelling in. So you see, rather fascinatingly, on these huge ships, designs that can be related to cubist and vorticist painting. So you've got animal camouflage and movements in art all translated onto the sides of ships. At war's end, no one really knows for certain if the unusual patterns ever stopped a German submarine. But the expense was relatively small, and it is said to have been a great boost to morale on the merchant ships. November 1918. Germany surrenders, blockaded into submission. The Kaiser is in exile. Albert Ballin, fearing that revolutionaries will imprison and torture him, commits suicide. The man who wrote Hapag's motto, My Field is the World, leaves a note behind. It reads, Better an end with dread than dread without end. Balin's floating palaces, the Imperator, the Vaterland, and the Bismarck, are now the prizes of war. Retribution to the Allies for their losses, the Lusitania, the Britannic, and the others. The most noted survivors are the Aquitania and Mauritania, both dazzle-painted when they served as hospital and troop ships. They will now bring the veterans home. The war is over and a new era has begun. With it will come a new beginning for the floating palaces. In another era, ships were just as fast, but far more plentiful. 
This waterfront was once packed with ocean liners and a fleet of admiring followers. On any day, the shipping news headlined the arriving vessels and the noted persons aboard. New York Harbor was like some great stage. The ships were the stars of their day, making grand entrances and exits in the shadow of Manhattan. Their voyages now seem like some plot in an old romantic novel. Their passengers a cast of unforgettable characters. They were built in Europe's greatest shipyards. Armies of men up to 10,000 strong welded and riveted them into shape. They became the pride and vanity of nations. They sailed under the flags of Britain, Germany, France and Italy and of the pretenders to power.